Good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Robin Howe, and I'm the vice president of uh, Sarasota University. And so actually today is our first ever, I suppose, I guess it is because it's something we've newly decided to do, uh, Montessori Colloquium. And um, what that is, is that is going to be a series of, I don't want to call it a lecture, but kind of like a lecture that we're going to be doing every month where we're going to bring in uh, different speakers to come and share with not just the Sarasota University community, but anybody that's interested in hearing about this month's topic. So thank you so much for joining us. I know that it's a very challenging, interesting time for the entire world, but certainly those of us working in schools. So I really appreciate you showing up. And um, today's guest is somebody who's very close to me, is Tim Selden, who I've known for almost 40 years. And today's topic is actually the history of Montessori in America, a brief history, because it's much longer. And um, just a short sort of uh, preview of that is this is something Tim's done for me in the past with other courses I've taught. And it's been one of the one of the, the faves and really interesting and something that not many of us know about. So I think it's uh, awesome that he's here to do that. And so with that, Tim, and to not take any more of your time, I'm just going to pass it over to you. Okay. So this is intended to be very personal reflections. I also want to say that in, in trying to think about this, there were so many people whose pictures I would put up, people I would name. There's no way it would be fair to everyone I forgot, or we could fit it into the 30 or so minutes we have. So I just want to apologize right now to everybody who I've known who is not reflected in here. Um, I've been in Montessori since uh, I think I first heard the word Montessori when I was still in high school at Barry. Um, and uh, I grew up in a school that my mother founded, which was Montessori inspired. Um, in college, I met a man named Gil Giuliani, who was my mentor. And in, when my mother died and I was headmaster, I began the journey of turning the school into a formal Montessori school. I served on the Mon American Montessori Society Board in Washington, D.C. I was very active with the Washington Montessori Teachers Association, Washington Montessori Institute. We had AMI teachers, AMS teachers, and through Gill, who was in that first class of the Washington Montessori Institute back in 62, 63, and his wife, Janet, um, I came to know Mario Montessori Jr. and Sr., and out of the Montessori and a lot of the people were still living uh, and during my years. And um, it was good to know them as individuals in a social setting as well as formal. So I wanna start with just the many faces of Montessori and acknowledge that Montessori today is who knows how many of us. One of the things that we're trying to do is get an accurate census uh, the Montessori Research Institute, the University of Kansas, National Center for Montessori in the Public Sector, Montessori Foundation, and the Center for Guided Montessori Studies, among others, are attempting to collaborate with many different Montessori societies to come up with a more accurate census. The general estimate in the U.S. is there's about 5,000 schools. Uh, we have that many in our database, but who knows, it would be twice as many or half as many. It's a moving target. They're big, they're small, they're public, they're charter, they're preschool, there's Montessori high school standing alone and everything in between. Uh, and Montessori as we know is pretty much worldwide. So having acknowledged that, I'm gonna talk about the birth of the movement Montessori's introduction to America, the ebbing of that initial enthusiasm, the beginning of the second wave came in the 19, late 50s, 60s, and how the movement has evolved from the late 50s to today. So we begin with the birth. The question is, who was Maria Montessori? We all see her through our own lens. We all notice different pieces of her. So depending on who you are and how you see her, you see her as a feminist, you see her as a doctor, you see her as a psychiatrist focused on mental health, you see her as someone who's focused on the needs of children with exceptionalities, 
you see her as a peace advocate, um, you see her as someone who is incredibly inspiring, or someone who was very suspicious of Americans and anyone who she thought was going to take advantage of her. There's a lot of different faces to the complex person who was Maria Montessori. What we know is that in her, you had several different things coming together to produce a unique perspective. First, we know she did not want to be a uh, teacher. She felt that was one of the, the lesser roles that women ought to consider in the time. We know that she worked really hard to become a scientist and a physician. We know that she battled uh, extreme misogyny uh, and discrimination. Uh, we also know that she was fascinated with the people that she met who were brain damaged, retarded. Uh, we've all heard about the orthophrenic school where she and uh, her <clears throat> very close colleague with whom she fathered a child spent two wonderful years working together, the orthophrenic school, the University of Rome. Uh, we know that she believed in free love. And by that, I don't mean sleep with whoever you want, but rather the idea that women are more than a wife, that they have the right to love and be loved outside of marriage or inside of marriage as they wanted. She was absolutely an advocate for women's rights and the vote and the equality before the law. And that was not the case where she lived. Um, we also know that she trained as an anthropologist, that she made a keen study of how to observe human beings and to really ask, what does the behavior I'm seeing mean from their perspective? And to keep very careful academic records of it. We know it began just last week or so. It was 115 years. I lose track of as the time goes by. But in January 6th of 1907, that's the picture taken of the children outside of the first Casa de Bambini. You can see the adults gathered on the other side of the fence. And that's Montessori giving a speech saying, the things that we're going to create here are going to astound the world. Not much her her properly there. Um, pictures from the very first school, the children carrying soup, uh, preparing lunch. Notice the child carrying that big terrain of soup. Remember, there are no microwaves or paper dishes. Cleanup time. These are all 1907, 1908. Notice the kids' uniforms. Uh, first off, Anyone that says Montessori to believe in uniforms really misses the point. She argued we don't want one child's dress to um, look better than someone else's. So we, we first off cover them up with aprons or something so they don't make their clothes worse. And we want to have equality. That's what at one of the schools they thought was a good uniform. Notice her right from the beginning. She's using the um, cursive alphabet. Uh, and the movable letters. That's a picture taken at one of the very first schools. First one starts in January of 1907. By the next year, she's got four going, two in Milan, another one in Rome. This one's, I believe, at the Monastery of the Franciscans in Rome. One of the better pictures of her during that period. So word begins to spread really quickly. This is from McClure's Magazine in 1910. That's an American mother who used the Montessori method at home to homeschool. And her kids can read and write English and Italian, according to the story that I found. Another, literally a snapshot of one of the articles. There's a series of them that occurs in the year 1910 and 1911. Uh, in McClure's magazine, and you pick them up in lots of places. Harvard University, University of Pennsylvania, popular press across the United States is talking about Maria Montessori and this miracle, as they called it. The first major book is this one, published by very famous, very wealthy American author, 
Dorothy Canfield Fisher. Uh, you may have heard of the Canfield Awards for Literature. That's her in 1911. Very first book is available today online, A Monastery Mother. I really encourage you to read it. It's in that book that Canfield Fisher says, I think Americans are misinterpreting or mistranslating the word Casa de Bambini. They're calling it children's house. And Casa in Italian means more than house. It means family, it means home. And she really talks about the psychological or spiritual, the community aspect of Montessori. This is the first book that Montessori published. It actually came out in 1909 in Italian. Uh, we've all seen the famous picture of her in the summer of 19, um, I think it was 1909, when having been exhausted by the work that she was doing around the clock, being both a doctor and working in these schools, uh, one of her wealthy friends invited her to the country. She spent a month and recuperated and sat there and wrote the book. This is the English translation, which came out in 1912, and it became very widespread. And of course, it's been reprinted year after year. This is a picture of the very first monastery school to open in the United States that we know of. It's in Terrytown, New York. Um, it was formed, on try I think this was Ann George, if I remember correctly, was, is the woman sitting there. Um, and it was in a very large, wealthy house in Terrytown, New York, and the children were of very affluent families. This book came out a few years later, uh, Monastery Children by Carolyn Sherwin Bailey. And a lot of you have not seen this probably. And it's really a fascinating book. These are just a couple of illustrations that I got out of it. Uh, but again, popular books began to pop up all over the place. This one I didn't realize. This was in Torreston, Philadelphia. It's the first building specifically built exclusively as a Montessori school not a room in a mansion like Alexander Graham Bell did, an actual school building built and designed for Montessori classes. This is a picture of Maria Montessori and SS McClure when she first came to America on her nationwide speaking tour. Uh, she's in New York City. She landed Brooklyn, New York the, at the yards there. Um, Notice she's wearing black. Um, this is something that she had done ever since her mother died in 1912. Mm -hmm. uh, on the right, you can see Alexander Graham Bell. He's probably the best known of her North American adherents. He put a lot of wealth behind the monastery movement and his fame. One of his interests, as you may know, was deaf education uh, and for him, one of the things he saw in Montessori was not only a way to educate children without exceptionalities, he was very impressed with the implications of what she was doing for the special needs children of the world. Um, this is the famous glass classroom, 1915 in San Francisco, the Pan American Exposition. Uh, this class ran for four months. Uh, Helen Parkhurst was the teacher in charge of the class. Notice the kids are sitting there for lunch. You may notice that they have candlesticks and everything. Mm -hmm. Again, elegance, real China, basic Montessori, over the top with beauty if you can. Um, one of the things I didn't realize is in the summer of 1915, the University of Pennsylvania faculty arranged for a summer school course for two, three months for people who were interested in learning how to be Montessori teachers. And I thank the folks, Jana Morgan Herman and, and Sid Mahandas at Montessori for finding this particular photograph. Now, Gautic, one of the famous writers of the history of Montessori, estimates that by 1925, there are more than a thousand Montessori schools in the United States. I have to tell you, 
I have not been able to verify that number, but it sounds good. Um, one of the things that's important for those of you who really are interested in the history is that the Monastery Education Association was created in the year 1911. Montessori blessed it when she came over in 1913. By 1914, she had become discouraged with Americans and she disowned it. And in 1915, she set up a totally different organization that she controlled and Alexander Graham Bell and his wife Mabel Bell resigned from the board of the Monastery Education Association and it closed down. However, the perception that Monastery died does not seem to be true. It just declined. And I think our own family story is part of that. We know something happened. Most Monastery schools by the 1940s seem to have closed or been rebranded. And notice the word rebranded, avoid losing enrollment because Montessori was no longer the in thing. There are a lot of reasons for it. We've all heard about this gentleman. We have heard Kilpatrick. What we don't realize is how famous this man was. He was the Dr. Spock of his day. Everybody who was in education was a fan of him and his own protege, Dr. John Dewey, who's, who really, had, by the time this book came out in 1914, was semi-retired. Uh, basically, Kilpatrick went over to Rome, spent a week looking at the schools, talking to Montessori, went back and wrote this very slim volume, which again, you can find in the Google Free Library, basically dismissing Montessori as 50 years out of date. And Dewey put the nail in the coffin by agreeing with him and saying, yeah, she's really very much like the old faculty psychology people who believe the brain was like a muscle you could exercise. Yeah, Let's have them decline and memorize Latin verbs. Hey, Scott. Hey, listen, I'm on a... Uh, Robin, uh, can you uh, mute Dr. Uh, Ogratna? So by 1917, Montessori's key person in the United States was Helen Parkhurst. She was the official coordinator, executive director of the Montessori Education Association. She was training Montessori teachers. She was consulting with schools all over the country. And she basically sends a letter to Maria Montessori uh, severing their relationship, not in anger, but basically what she says in the letter that's been found is Maria Montessori has a wonderful message to give. And I have a voice too, and I need to let my voice sing. But that was a really fatal blow for Montessori's work in the United States. Hello. Okay, so why did it happen? Well, among other things, Americans originally loved Montessori because we were at the turn of the century, in the early 1900s, awash with immigrants whose children did not speak English. This had not been the first time that our major cities had large immigrant populations, but the tide of immigrants that was coming in at that point was alarming people, especially since in the last 20 or so years of the 1800s, we all know about Karl Marx, the Communist Manifesto, the development of anarchism, the um, assassination of the various heads of state in Europe, uh, and the workers' union rise. And Americans, generally speaking, were looking for something that might reduce the slum and Americanize kids. So the population of the schools are expanding and the school systems are absolutely overwhelmed very much like we're hearing today. Supply chain could not keep up. Um, they needed a quick way of teaching kids English. And this was a time when people were fascinated with science, innovation, and the efficiency of the factory. That's how we got our modern school system. Monastery being based on a replicable system. Yeah, 
Montessori being based on a replicable model really appealed to a lot of American intellectuals. And there was the question in those days of whether intelligence and behavior was genetic or whether it could be influenced by education. Robin, could you mute Ron? So Robin, again, please mute everyone. Mute me. Montessori's initial success was in the slums. Again, that's slums of Italy. We had slums in America, in all the major cities. It worked with families of great wealth and middle class families. So you had the power brokers, people in the Congress of the United States, sending their kids to Montessori schools in Washington, D.C., in New York City, and in Boston, all over the least up to Chicago and then over to San Francisco. Uh, the American progressive education movement that John Dewey and Kirkpatrick were part of had really pretty much opened the way because intellectually, there's an awful lot of similarity between Montessori and what Dewey was teaching. And then Montessori had an incredibly wide base of support. Top people in the United States, including Woodrow Wilson, Alexander Graham Bell, Alfred Ed Edison, Ford. I mean, you just didn't quit. If you look at the first edition of Maria Montessori's American translation of the book, it's the president of Harvard who writes the introduction. Uh, and Montessori was promoting the importance of the individual, which of course appeals to the American ideal of who we see ourselves. And Montessori had great success with young girls, which appealed to the uh, feminist movement of our day. And her approach offered hope for the education of the blind, which appealed to yet another section. So this is all of the factors that were in her favor. And our argument is we really blew the opportunity in those days. Now, what messed it up? Well, first off, Maria Montessori herself was the biggest obstacle. Her tendency to be off-putting and rather harsh in her communication, both in person and in by letters, was not very good. I mean, we found telegrams and letters where she's basically really off-putting. Um, so her supporters began to really feel alienated from her. She distrusted Americans. She thought all we cared about was money. Uh, and she insisted on controls and Americans tend to want to innovate and fiddle around with things. We want to expand quickly. And then a little thing came along called World War I, which initially did not prevent Montessori from coming over, but it did have rather dramatic effects on transatlantic travel, uh, the economy, um, things were pretty messed up in both Europe and the United States in the war years and the years that followed, which led American educators to challenge her ideas more and more and more for lots of reasons, part of which is misunderstanding and part of it is it wasn't invented here. We also have to remember that um, most of the schools, no matter how many there were in 1925, by 1930, most of them were gone. The Great Depression whacked them right out. And so private school enrollment in general went down for the first five years of the 1930s. But notice this article from the New York Times in 1941. It's celebrating a Montessori school in the city, which is serving needy children and is now 25 years old. I keep finding lots of these examples. And then there's another school that opened up in 1932. Dr. Howe's alumni, alumni of that school, that's the Barry School. Um, Barry was one of the very first schools to be both hands-on, progressive, see itself as being Montessori-inspired, definitely did not use the name Montessori, uh, 
horses, goats, animals, greenhouses, uh, kids cooking the lunch and serving, um, doing all sorts of things. And it was revolutionary because it was one of the first year round schools. So at a time when very few young kids went to school at all, uh, it was a school that one took in children in Washington DC, whether you were black, Asian, Hispanic, rich, poor, everybody was called by the first name. Uh, it was open 360 days a year. Um, and uh, mom deliberately set aside 30% of the income to provide needs-based financial aid. And I think in the early years, it was much greater. So that was a 17 acre campus and that's the main building of the original Barry School. Oh, this doesn't, didn't blow up well. Montessori meanwhile is opening up schools. That's the Montessori School that she founded in the 1930s in Lauren in the Netherlands. Um, she continued to give courses. We all know the general story. 1929, she founds the Association Montessori International. Her son, Mario, uh, is the um, director general of it. And she uses that for the purpose of trying to maintain the fidelity of the method. She travels around the world. She lives in Barcelona in part because Italy was going through a series of periods where it wasn't very comfortable for her to live. And she had a lot of bad memories with the death of both her mother and her father. So when her father dies in 1915 and she's invited to lecture in Barcelona and they say, oh, please stay, she stays. Spends a lot of the next 10 years or so living in uh, Barcelona. We know that Maria Montessori dies in 1952. This is, of course, the famous grave in the Catholic cemetery outside of Amsterdam. And then we have the beginning of the second wave. So this is Nancy McCormick Rambush in 1953. She's a young mom. Um, it's important to understand the way this began. Nancy always described herself and her colleagues as bright, sassy, young parents. Uh, she doesn't say bright, sassy, affluent, New York City, Connecticut, Catholic, liberal, let's transform parochial education. That's one of the reasons why so many um, Catholic teaching societies adopted Montessori. They certainly did it in Italy and, and Spain, uh, and really in most of Europe. And there was always a perception among some people that it was a Catholic education. But there were just as many Jewish Montessori educators, uh, Jewish Montessori schools, and Jewish kids in Europe tended to be drawn to these schools if their families were not Orthodox because they were welcoming, they were kind. And so for the same reason, children go to our schools today. So, Nancy approaches Mario in 1953 and says, I'd like to start a Montessori inspired school. And of course, Mario famously says, there's no such thing as a Montessori inspired school, you either are or you're not. And um, she decides, okay, I'll go and I'll take my training. So in 1954 to 1955, she takes first the early childhood course, then she takes the elementary course, and by the way, you get a lot of conflicting information if you just read superficially. So for example, at the Bergamo Center, they claim to be the first and only elementary teacher training course. Well, how do you think there are all those elementary schools in Germany and Sweden, Denmark, and so forth? What was going on is the Bergamo Center was created later as an elementary only. But anyway, in 1958, she comes back to the United States. She creates the Whitby School. I think this slide is just a little out of order. In 1962, she publishes this first book, Learning How to Learn. And that's how dog eat my book is. This book becomes very well known. That's the original home of the Whitby School. 
not in Greenwich, outside of Greenwich. That's a stable that had been converted. And again, um, Rambush is the headmistress. They bring over um, a teacher trainer, Margaret Stevenson, who is training at the Whitby School. Um, some very well-known Montessorians were in that original course, um, one of whom was the late Dr. Paul Chaya, uh, who was a faculty member at Whitby. And many of you may know Jack Blessington, who was on the faculty as well and became headmaster for many years. And also AMS and AMI in those days were the same. AMS was the American branch of AMI. Um, and pretty much everything was run out of the Whitby School. This is, again, a little pixelated, but a photograph of Nancy Rambush and Margaret Stevenson meeting with a group of people interested in Montessori in upstate New York. And they basically did the circuit, spreading the word, going on television. Um, she famously was on the Today Show with Dave Garraway, um, brought in a pink tower and the monkey J. Fred Muggs was playing with the pink tower. Um, but the, the popularity really exploded. This is, again, a little pixelated when it's blown up this big, but that's one of the few pictures I could find of Margaret Stevenson. I need to go into my own archives and find a better one. But Betty Stevenson, this is towards the end of her life, was um, Mario's au pair and then became a Montessori guide and a teacher trainer herself. And she came over for the purpose of beginning the reestablishment of Montessori in America. In 1961, 1962, things began to get shaky. In the summer of 1962, the AMS board decided to go its own way uh, with AMI. And I remember in the spring, probably May of 1962, I was sitting on the front lawn of the Barry School. And Miss Stevenson came to me with my mother about she could turn all, all of the teachers of the Barry School legitimate. Um, my mother wasn't very nice to her because they were doing in-house training. Um, but that's the famous original home of the Washington Monastery Institute on S Street. Um, at the same time, there's another force bringing Montessori. This is a picture of a movie star by the name of, uh, oh gosh, I'm blanking on his name, Billy Jack. Um, gosh, I remember his name. It'll come to me. Um, anyway, um, the fellow, Tom Laughlin. Tom Laughlin was a well-known movie star in Hollywood. He was in London. He got to know Claude and Francesca Claremont, who were kind of in retirement in 1962. Um, and they were the original London Montessori trainers um, working for AMI, uh, doing early childhood and elementary. Anyway, Tom brought them to Santa Monica, California. They opened a school, they opened a college, this Dr. Claremont and his wife. Uh, and that was a second wave that ultimately led to Miss Lena and the development of the program in California, down in Los Angeles. And it just began to spread very rapidly. So by 1962, we have two groups and they're both living in their own world. The AMI is again older, it's the original group that Montessori founded to protect the integrity of the legacy and the work. Its focus was on development of policies that would ensure consistency in teacher training and understanding of the theory and the Montessori educational standards. And the teacher trainers were selected and trained by AMI. That's an important distinction compared to what happened in AMS. So one of the things that led to this was early educators and parents were challenging us because why did children have to only start at age three or younger? 
what do you mean a four-year-old couldn't enter? In those days, there was a three-year cycle and you started at three and that was the way it was. Um, three and four-year-olds stayed until noon and then they had to go home. And moms were expected to either have someone who could be their nanny or to not work and pick them up and take them home. You didn't see afternoon programs except at those schools that began to break away from this tradition. Five-year-olds would stay for another work cycle. And in those days, there was little or no art, music, or dance in schools. And a key part of this to keep in mind is that's not the Montessori tradition. That's not AMI. That's just what was happening in many Montessori schools at that time. You look at European Montessori schools, you'll find plenty of art and music and history and geography, science and gardening. And parents were not at all welcomed into the classrooms. There were some other concerns. One is children were very much discouraged from any fantasy play. You probably have all heard this in your own training or either seen it or heard that once upon a time this happened. Uh, again, the cultural subjects really were almost absent. There was, kids were told basically, you're not ready for that work yet. I'll give you a lesson when you're ready. There were pre-expected ages when children were going to be given lessons. And they were really discouraged from exploring variations or extensions. And some Montessori educators conveyed a sense that the child didn't fit in with the mold. Maybe Montessori wasn't right for them. They weren't the right children for Montessori. And there were parents who obviously felt something's wrong with that. So the American Montessori Society began to challenge and question. And Rambush argued that we needed to integrate Montessori into the United States school systems that we needed to have our teachers take a college degree first, that we wanted our teacher training to be consistent with the training that was needed to teach in a government school. Um, and she, she certainly argued, you know, we wanna follow the Montessori method, but the method is continuously evolving was the argument. So again, the expectation was, college degrees. It took a long time before that became very much the norm. And even now, everyone's allowed for what we call provisional or associate credentials. They wanted to integrate Montessori into university departments of education. They wanted to get Montessori into the public schools as fast as possible. And I remember when we had an opportunity to get it into Head Start, um, this was very much key goals. And we wanted to encourage the development of elementary and secondary Montessori programs, which were already existing. I mean, in Holland, there have been Montessori high schools since the 30s. Um, but the goal was to really ramp it up so that a family could go to a non-public or a public school and have Montessori all the way through high school if that's what they wanted. So. This is an early draft statement from 1962 done by Cleo Munson, the first executive director of the American Montessori Society. And it really gives you a flavor of where the differences were. One was focused on maintaining the original model and being faithful to full implementation. The other was focused on integrating into the American society and being more flexible getting it into the government schools so that it would last. So a couple of key books came out pretty early on. Uh, Maria Montessori, Her Life and Work, Standing's book, The Montessori Revolution in Education. Really, it's both are standing. These were probably the first books a lot of us ever saw. Paula Polk Lillard comes along a little later. Um, her book, Montessori, A Modern Approach. And um, there's one I can't, uh, there, was, there was another one called The Hidden Hinge, which I think was Hainstock, which came out in the early 70s. But again, by 68, 70s, Montessori was boiling. 
lots and lots of interest in Montessori. Seemed like Montessori teacher training programs were popping up all over the place. And AMS was just scrambling at that point to meet the needs. And this is when I got on the AMS board and began to be involved with. I wasn't there in 62. So they decided again to work independently of AMI. Rambush publishes Learning How to Learn. Lots of books follow. Lots and lots of press coverage. Lots and lots of articles in newspapers. Parent groups are talking about it. Drikers is publishing Children the Challenge. The development of any number of parenting education programs are being developed. And I think a key thing to keep in mind is Montessori homeschooling is bursting at the seams. And we often forget that. I mean, going back to the Second World War, when uh, St. Nicholas began to send out homeschooling correspondence courses, they were mostly aimed at homeschooling families. Meanwhile, AMI establishes its own network. They begin to develop teacher training centers. Kitty, I don't remember what year you trained. I know you were at Atlanta um, and then must have been eight or nine teacher training centers. And it was a lot of work. I mean, nine months of full-time study. Uh, it produced excellent teachers. Um, it was not easily expandable. It took a long time to become a teacher trainer. Uh, and if you were ambitious, you had to be chosen. It's not like you could go out and say, I want to do this. You need to be selected as someone to do it. And yet both groups continue to expand, but they very rarely knew what the other were doing. There was some antagonism, but mostly that was hurt feelings from the way the two separated originally. By the 70s, we know we had a thousand schools. Uh, we had more than 200 of those schools were large and well-established, 200 to 300 students or more, all private at that point. The number of teacher training programs was growing so rapidly that whenever we met for our semi-annual meetings, the teacher education committee need bigger and bigger rooms every quarter or every uh, half year because it wouldn't fit in the same room. And the number of programs applying for accreditation was incredible. Um, we were running three conferences a year, one national and two regional, and we were beginning to cross a thousand person level a year. Uh, Jim Hennis founded the AMS School Accreditation Program in 1976. I became the director of it in 78, and it took a long time. Now, let's go back a moment. 1961, Mario Montessori sets up the Bergamo Montessori Center. And there are so many fantastic Montessori educators who had the gift of being sponsored to go to Bergamo, Italy, and spend a year studying there. There's another fantastic center in Perugia, Italy for early childhood. There are lots of these centers around. Of course, London's been doing it for years. There's been one in um, France for many, many, many years. I mean, 60 years old now, as I recall, because that's where Hilda Rothschild trained. Um, the bottom line is we began a serious focus within Montessori on elementary. It was like a new thrust. NAPTA was formed in 1974. By the way, I'm seeing different dates. So if you find a better date, um, as far as I can tell, it's 74. But I seem to remember when I first got involved with Barry, NAPTA was running in Washington um, out of one of the monastery schools in DC. So it may have started Tim, earlier. Tim, I'm going to interrupt you real quick and just say it is 747. And I'm going to actually suggest something that I very rarely suggest, which is that. We keep on going because I think that, you know, I think that for me certainly and hopefully for everybody else, this is really important. So if you are okay to just keep on going and we can either decide when you finish, whether we want to continue with questions or set up another session, but I'm going to suggest you keep going even though it's 747 and you know that's unique for me. It is, Robin. Okay. Thank you. So 
Public Monastery actually started earlier than Cincinnati, started as far as I remember in Fairfax, Virginia, but it was typically a few classrooms in a school. In the 1970s in Sarasota, Florida, there were a couple of classrooms running in the Sarasota public school system. So there were lots of these little pods of Montessori, but Sands Montessori, which didn't look like this when it began, was the first full commitment to Montessori. Now, Xavier University had been training Montessori teachers since I think 1963. What really exploded this thing was the coming together of some really fascinating people. Uh, Mrs. Dresser was the head of the Xavier program in those days, as I recall. Um, Martha McDermott, Hilda Rothschild um, is a fourth whose name is escaping me at the moment. But what happened was they came together and they not only built up the Xavier program, they were able to get funding to get the public school district to pay to sponsor teachers into the training, to buy the materials and to set up a complete school as Montessori. That was a truly major feat for its time. And they need to be recognized for that. And Cincinnati continues to be an incredibly fervent, innovative center of Montessori, as is Washington, Philadelphia, Boston, so many communities. Columbus Montessori Center or Comet was the first AMS affiliated elementary teacher education. They started in 1976. And again, in those days, it was so hard to find an elementary teacher. It's very much like what it's like to have a school that's got a Montessori middle school program today. Those teachers are rarer than hen's teeth. And a high school teacher, an upper elementary, they're really rare. And so it was a tough, slow start. Uh, a couple of years later, Harvey Hallenberg and I founded the Institute for Advanced Monastery Studies at Barry, and in 1982, we expanded it to be the first accredited secondary teacher training program. And Barry was the first recognized Montessori high school. I should mention Barry has since dropped that because the state of Maryland requires, if you're going to call it Montessori, that everybody, including the substitutes, is Montessori credential. So it's very, very expensive to do that. So I'd say they're back to being progressive. And there are lots of great schools that are, are not following the original plan, but are still trying to do the best they can. Um, 1992, five of us got together and created the Monastery Foundation. Originally, it was an offshoot of the American Monastery Society. That's uh, uh, Patty Calvert on the left, my wife, Joyce St. Germain, Robin's mom. Next to her, Nancy McCormick Rambush in the middle, Marie Dugan, and me without my beard. And our goal was to serve schools by helping their heads, their boards, and by providing an independent voice to parents. Clark Montessori opened in 1994, the first Montessori public high school. And as you know, hopefully it's an award-winning gold star school. Other monastery high schools have opened up all over the country. 2005, we finally got the US Department of Education to recognize a monastery accrediting council. And I can't overemphasize how incredibly important MACD has been. It was not easy to get that done. We actually started the effort to build it somewhere is around 1980-85, Joy Turner and a bunch of us got together and we convened AMI and AMS and we put, had to put out a public notice and training societies we had never heard of showed up. And the next thing we realized is it wasn't AMS or AMI, there was something called MEPI and there was something called the Pan American Monastery Society and St. Nicholas, I, it was all over the place. So it took quite a few years before the Department of Ed said, okay, you're all working together, we'll recognize you. And it has been invaluable to the Montessori community in helping us to be taken seriously 
and to work together. It's also taken away a lot of the backroom politics that I remember in the old days of, what do you mean we're gonna have two training programs in Chicago or in Florida? Uh, it used to be sort of divvied up by territory. Um, we all probably remember 2005 for the creation of this wonderful book by our friend Angeline Stowe Lillard, Paula Polk Lillard's daughter, Monastery, the Science Behind the Genius. And you probably know that the next year she came out with a seminal first study. That was the first study comparing one system of education against all others that was considered by the American Academy for the Advancement of Science to be scientifically valid. That study, of course, was repeated just a year or so ago up in Hartford. And I cannot say how much of a debt we owe to people like Angeline Stowe Lillard. Um, National Center for Monastery in the Public Sector, or actually it was preceded by our friend Danny Shapiro back in 1994 to jump around a bit. I will always remember him becoming a sort of one person advocate for monastery in the public sector and creating out of his publishing company, a newsletter, a national directory, uh, a real fervent, a sense of identity for people working in the public sectors, which ultimately led to the creation of the National Center for Monastery in the Public Sector in 2012. And there are other groups that are out there working today to promote monastery in the public sector. Then in 2013, notice these are joint AMS AMI initiatives. Now, those of us who are part of IMC or other groups might say, well, wait a minute, we're part of it too. But they are the ones who formed it. They are the ones putting in the money. And so we'll give them the credit. They're doing the hard work um, to promote advocacy at the state level, to try to watch public policy and to work together with MACD for the recognition of monastery credentials as valid within the state regulations, whether in a public or a private school. Equity began to be a big issue about this same time. And of course, it really took off a little bit later, but in 2013, we had the formation of monastery Monasterians for Social Justice. And that work continues to advance today in many forms, both in this organization and the IMC, AMS, AMI, MEPI. Lots of people are working on how do we do good work so that everyone feels heard, seen, and welcomed at the table. So we all remember what last year was like, the year of Zoom. We probably know what it's like this year. And so what's ahead? Well, hopefully this. So that ends my brief reflection on the history of Montessori. So Tim, I don't wanna, I bet there's a lot of ways that people could participate in questions. And so I wanna present to you a couple options. Um, well, Norman, Dr. Lorenz raised his hand, so I'm going to ask him to, to but we're, we're five minutes in. So we, what I do want to share is that I'm going to ask Tim if he's willing to go a little bit longer. Also share that if Tim is willing to go a little bit later, we will record this. So if you have to leave at eight o'clock Eastern time, please do so. We certainly want to respect your time. Um, and we're usually trying to be very good, but there's, I just did not want to stop him obviously going. So um, with that, I just want to sort of also just mention that if you happen to leave, I don't know if I mentioned explicitly that this is part of what we're doing now. This colloquium is part of Sarasota University's uh, monthly meeting. And so again, this is something that we're doing um, to the Montessori community. And if you're interested in learning more about what Sarasota University is doing, and we're doing a lot of really exciting things and a lot of really exciting changes, please just reach out to us. Um, but again, this the purpose of Sarasota University and the mission is really to serve well, certainly students, but also promote Montessori education and serve Montessori throughout the world. So um, with that, Tim, I'm going to open up the question and Dr. Renz has his name up. And again, this is going to be recorded. And um, if you have to leave, leave. But if not, and Tim, if you're willing, please stick around. <laughs>
happy to do it. And Norman, I want to acknowledge that I didn't really talk about any monastery organizations other than AMS or AMI. And when I first met you, you were involved with NCMA. And uh, I'm the chair of the board of the International Monastery Council. And we could just keep running down the alphabet soup of organizations and fabulous people in the United States. So again, for anyone that I didn't mention, I, I just couldn't fit it in. I will try to moderate these things, but go ahead, Norman, go for it. And I, I certainly want to thank you, Tim. It was, it was such a pleasure to hear you share the early history and then the hair on the neck uh, of my neck began to raise as you started describing the late 70s and the early 80s because I became involved. And I, I distinctly remember that I actually stepped up forward to take on a training center and I was quizzed by Loanne Junt who said, who invited you? And I said, I invited myself. And I really had to prove to her and now 40 years later in Montessori education, uh, I've fulfilled all experiences from private to public, uh, teacher training and higher education, uh, charter school and private school. And it's just been a menagerie. And um, I shall say it was a, a roller coaster ride, but I really appreciate the history that you've shared with all of us because certainly Sarasota University is a culmination of all of those years put together uh, to put Montessori leadership on the map as we instill that across the master's program students that are currently enrolled and the up and coming doctoral uh, individuals that are you know, waiting at the gate to get in. Um, so I really wanna thank you for bringing that forward and presenting it to all of us this evening. And you're right, it's been an incredible journey uh, to know each other as colleagues all of these years. And uh, thank you for, for tonight. It's uh, very special. Thanks, Norman. I really appreciate it. Um, I will say this about Sarasota University. We've worked with so many great universities. I've done that for so many years, Trinity College and Loyola, Westminster, and all these different wonderful schools that go back into the history. What I always was concerned about was that Montessori would be a backbench in a school of education, which is normally what happens. And whenever you're in the backbench, you never know what's gonna happen. And that's why the idea of a university where we're really looking at the question of how do you teach adults using Montessori strategies? And how do you have a university that's focused completely on the Montessori ethos, not just the offering of Montessori programs, but that's all we do. Um, right. So, and again, we're not focused on any society. The idea is to no. work with the universities and any societies in any way we can to further research. And, 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 and that is very true. I, I actually did my doctoral work in education leadership and Montessori was uh, my, my dissertation around when you implement it with people who have never heard the word. And I em embraced the principles and practices into community college systems. And, and I too would, would applaud what you shared about the fact that although there was some, sometimes it felt like backbiting, uh, I had a, the tremendous opportunity to be the president of MACD as it became USDE recognized in the early 2000s. And it has been a linchpin to moving us forward and making sure that despite what Dr. Montessori said about not being involved in government, that in the United States, that's where we get the political power to deem that Montessori is a viable uh, institution, whether we choose it to be private sector or in the public. And I've started two Montessori charters uh, and uh, they're both accredited through AMS currently. Uh, I'm not involved with them as I once was, but I do now have a Montessori inspired high school because that's the best we can be right now. And it's an incredible journey um, that we bring Montessori pedagogy to the forefront of our 21st century learning. Oh, well, Nora. Anyone else? 
Yeah, please. Um, you know, again, I, I know we're going late, and so we we're, we're recording all of this. So if you have questions, I, I, Deborah, I saw a, a little hand raised, and I'm not on gallery view. So if you raise your hand, do the uh, little emoji Icon. thing. But Deborah, Thank go you. for it. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thanks, Tim, so much. Um, you and I met 100 years ago, it feels like, but Montessori in Sarasota. You showed me around and um, we had some great conferences together. I just wanted to comment on your presentation. It was tingly, as, um, as our previous uh, speaker was saying. And it was uh, fascinating to see the history come through and reminded me of, of why I got into Montessori and what a great presenter you are. Thank you for having such a fabulous slide show but not reading to us but letting us read for ourselves while you added your commentary uh, beautifully presented eloquent and elegant as you are so thank you thanks deborah you're very welcome good to see you again anyone else i'll just mention that there were some pictures in there i've never seen so it was really exciting and some little bits of the history i hadn't heard so thank you tim it was a lot of fun and uh i'm glad this has been recorded and uh you know we need to to celebrate our history and our past and the work we're doing as we move forward could not agree more well um, hopefully, I'll find higher res versions of those pictures. I thought I, uh, everything was was pretty decent because some of those pictures, even like the inaugural um, uh, ceremony, um, for, that's the best version of that picture I have seen. It's the first time where I could really see clearly the fence where the adults were on the other side. I never had had known that that's what that was because all of the other pictures I've seen are such poor pictures. One of the things that I'm looking for, if any of you find them, are, are movies of the early schools. I'm finding some things on YouTube about Montessori in Italy that were made by uh, the Italian government in the late 20s, early 30s. But I'm trying to find, ideally, the original footage the Montessori brought with her of her schools that she used on her lecture tours. So we know that McClure had them for a year. She took them back, and we don't know where they are. So I'm going to, I haven't reached out to Lynn Lawrence yet to see if AMI has got anything in the archives. Uh, but I think it's important to know our history. Let me let me add one more piece I didn't put into the, the speech. Um, I, I learned there's a new biography of Montessori coming out in March. It's called The Child is the Teacher. It's translated very literally from the Italian. So it's a funny read, um, all in the present tense. But it's one of the most thoroughly researched histories of Rhea Montessori I've ever seen. One of the things I did not realize is that Maria Montessori, um, well, there's a chapter in there, Maria Montessori, Advocate of Free Love. And you know, I tried to put that into historical perspective. What did that mean at this time, which was certainly not libertine. Um, and I did not realize that Maria Montessori had a relationship with uh, Giuseppe Montesano uh, for about four or five years. Their plan was to never get married to anybody, but to have a relationship. We know, and this is something I didn't know, Giuseppe was a secular Jewish fellow, um, a liberal, a socialist like Maria Montessori, and a fellow doctor. Uh, and something I didn't know. Um, and he gave, caved into family pressure. Hey, we want grandkids um, from a nice Jewish girl. And apparently he did. This was not, did not go over well with Maria Montessori. Um, we also know that in 1917, Mario Montessori married Helen, I think her last name was Christ, uh, Texan. And that's where uh, that's the mother of uh, Mario Jr. and the mother of, um, um, gosh, I'm blanking, please, uh, Rinelda and Philip. 
um, well, Philip's the, uh, the grandson of one of them. Um, so there's, there's just so much more, more history to tell. Well, Tim, I think just based on the response, I think that this ought to be something that we certainly continue and then possibly even, you know, Dr. Lorenz and I and uh, Ms. Reed here, we're talking about courses and which is gonna lead me into a short segue. Um, I think that this, as part of our programs, having a history of Montessori ought to be a course um, in each of our programs, because I think adding to the, it certainly adds to the context. And um, so hopefully you'll help us develop that. But sure. um, one of the things that I wanted to just share, and again, like keep it open, I'm gonna keep it open for questions as long as possible. But one of the things that we're really trying to do as Tim mentioned, talking about Sarasota University as a true Montessori University is, for those of you who are not familiar, recently um, we've gone through a transition of sorts and, and, and certainly want to recognize the work that's been done in the past by Dr. Grodnick and Dr. Dorr and that sort of thing and, and, and many others. But what we're really gearing to do is try to do this sort of thing and really try to gear this towards a being a Montessori University, not only in teaching Montessori, not becoming a teacher education program, but teaching in a Montessori way. So this is sort of our, a, a first, you know, not a first, but we're, we're getting in that progress. So I just wanted to share that for those of you that are not familiar and acknowledge what you said, Tim, and, um, and just sort of possibly close on that. But if not, I, you know, keep it open to others. Um, and Tim, I did share your private email. So if, if Tim was actually responding to chats, he'd send he said he'd actually share his, share his cell phone because that's just what he does. <laughs> but um, I did share your your personal email, Tim. So those of you who are interested in in more, and I and Tim, I hope that we can have you back to, you know, possibly even share questions. But as you all have seen, he has a very unique perspective on Montessori and the evolution of Montessori in the United States, having lived it. And um, I'm really appreciative for you, Tim, for joining us tonight. And those of you, you know, for some of you, it's past eight o'clock. So I really appreciate all of you joining us. And this recording will be shared. So uh, look forward to seeing you all soon.